Welcome to the GCN Show. Coming up this week, is low carb training now a thing of the past? The latest scientific research suggests that Team Sky won in spite of their low carb training rather than because of it. We have also got 20 questions with Aussie cycling legend Richie Port. We think it's 20, but I don't think anyone's actually counted yet. No, we probably didn't count, did we? Plus, the man that is riding every single day for 10,000 days, the bikes held hostage that have now been released, and the police department using bikes to bait thieves. Before we go on though, a quick notice to say that after 575 GCN shows, you can now get this as a podcast, so you no longer have to put up with looking at us. Happy day. So if you're listening, welcome along. This week in the world of cycling, we learned that Jonas Vinigor and Sepp Kuss are a little bit fitter than I am. Oh, sorry, I'm just in a swift ride. I'll have to call you back. No, I'm starting to sweat. Me too. Are you? Here we go, right. Nine minutes in, effort level, one to ten. Sepp? Still the same about two. <laughs> Still two, just I've got a yeah. sweat on. Honestly, who would have thought? Weird, isn't it? Uh, now, from one set of Galacticos, to another, we also learned that the titans of cyclocross might actually be human after all. In the latest round of the World Cup in Benidorm, Peacock hit a barrier, didn't he? Thunderball hit a pole, and Wout van Aert, well, poor old Wout van Aert. Yeah, having hopped the barriers every lap, slightly sketchily, yeah. I might add, on the last lap he decided to run them for safety, Good except idea. that he completely messes it up and ends up crashing anyway. I did actually drop him a message oh, after this, yeah. I said, not to worry, wow, it happens to the best of us. Yeah, who did it better? <laughs> Answers in the comments. Uh, he still clung on to win though, despite losing his saddle in that crash. Yeah, he didn't seem to notice. No. But uh, we think that maybe it's because he's got an Ahu chamois. That's his uh, clothing sponsor there. Clearly comfortable no matter what you're sat on. Yeah, you really railed the last few corners of the race there, didn't he? Railed. Oh, saddle, saddle rails. rails. Yes, got it. Thank they you. They can't be yeah. that comfy though, can they? <laughs> anyway, we also learned that the shockwaves running through the bike industry have reached one of the big players after Scott announced that they were taking a 150 million euro loan from their parent company for a little bit of liquidity. Mm. Now, lastly, we also learned this week that there is no place for low-carb diets in the world of cycling. Now, I can already hear some of you at home shouting at the screen. All the speakers, as is the case now, if you're listening to this as a podcast. Of Very course. true, yeah. Shouting at anything, frankly. Um, but we knew that. Yes, no, of course, there are many of you out there who have always thought that cycling without carbohydrate is going to have a detrimental rather than a beneficial effect. Yeah, we've had quite a few comments over the years, haven't we? We have, but then there are plenty of top-level pros who have used low-carb or fasted training in the past, and we did too, because that was what a lot of the top coaches felt was the best approach. Yeah, coaches and dietitians, didn't they? Most notably at Team Sky, uh, mainly because of their use of that strategy coincided with their most successful era. Chris Froome, for example, was often reported to train on low carbs and he even posted this picture from a rest day of the Tour de France in 2016, which he went on to win. Yeah. What's the picture of? Uh, it is avocado, poached eggs. I think that was about it. Wow. <laughs> Nice. Mid Tour de France. Yes. Rest day. Bonkers. Uh, now, the idea of low carb training was that it would make your body more efficient, encouraging it to use fat as fuel, therefore saving valuable glycogen stores and making carbohydrates an even higher octane fuel when you did finally dip into them during a race. However, recent research from Gorka Prieto Belva, with Inigo Samalan, one of the contributors, has effectively debunks the whole theory. That's right, so the study followed 17 male cyclists classified as highly trained, between 15 and 20 hours a week. That is highly trained. Which does sound like quite a lot these days. Um, and they're racing at a decent level as well. They were then randomly assigned to either a carbohydrate periodization group 
or a high carbohydrate group, and then completed the same training program over five weeks. Carbohydrate periodization being restricted carbs uh, for certain training sessions, i.e. fasted training. No breakfast, and then not much when you're riding a bike either. Yeah, so if you would like to see the full details of the study, we'll leave a link in the description below to it, but we'll skip to the results. Yes. Which showed, we almost feel like we need a drum roll. Thank you, Dan. No difference between the carbohydrate periodization group and the high carbohydrate group. So both groups, this is important, okay? Both groups improved in key areas by the same amount. However, crucially, when they tested for carbohydrate and fat oxidizations, so that's fat burning, if you like, there was also no difference. So what we thought fasted training does, it clearly doesn't actually do. I knew that I shouldn't have done low carb for that race with Sepp and Jonas last <laughs> week. <laughs> well, as you said, the conclusion showed no conceivable difference. No. Uh, so I'm not sure that it's not you an would excuse. push them any harder <laughs> uh, if you had. Anyway, they're blatantly on high carb diets, though. I mean, they're probably they carb were probably They were probably fuelled for that ride. I bet they were, sure. yeah. Um, now, anyway, you might be wondering why this is a big deal, given that both groups performed similarly at the end of the trial period. They both made improvements. And the answer is that it means that none of us need to take the risks, and they are big risks, aren't they, potentially, associated with restricting carbohydrates in the hope or the thinking that it will lead to performance gains. Exactly. Uh, there are a number of riders, pro and amateur, who have burnt out through training hard whilst restricting their carbohydrates. Some have gotten away with it, uh, but others have really struggled to cope. Given the results of this study, it seems futile to even bother trying, doesn't it? Yeah. And I mean, we really can't drum home that message like enough, can we? Because there are so many riders that I can think of that have completely ruined themselves by trying to ride mm. on no carbs. Eating is cheating, being yeah. the phrase that... Well, Lawrence the Blues, he was on Geraint Thomas's podcast a few weeks ago, and he said he broke himself trying to follow Geraint's training regimen combined with a low-carb strategy at the time. Yeah. I mean, similarly, following a super high carb strategy like Tade Pogacar, if you haven't got his power output, is also not no. terribly smart, but certainly restricting carbs, it's out now, isn't it? Um, let us know your thoughts though, and whether you've ever experimented with a low carb diet um, whilst maintaining training, basically. If you're super interested to hear your thoughts on I'd that. I'd be very interested as well. Uh, moving on though, to an interview with Richie Port. So Alex was out in Adelaide for the Tour Down Under last week, and he caught up with Richie for a quick Q&A. Roughly 20. Around, yeah, around 20 questions. We think around 20 answers. <laughs> okay, right, we've got Richie Port. Richie, we're going 20 questions. Are you ready? I'm ready. <laughs> right, first one. How many kilometres did you ride last year? Oh, 11,000. Oh. Um, what would be your best place to ride? Uh, Tasmania, where I hail from. God's country. What would be your bike of choice? Bike of choice, Specialized SLA. Oh, good call. Um, what is the fastest you've ever been on a bike? Oh, I think maybe 107 kilometers out in Colorado. That's outrageous. Yeah, yeah. like big, big what, four lane freeway. Yeah, <laughs> that must be wild with that speed. Yeah, Switzerland's pretty fast too. Like I mean, anything, anything triple figures is wild. Yeah. Um, what was your FTP at your peak? I don't know. Roughly. I never really got into I don't even really know what an FTP is, to be honest. <laughs> like, the highest power you could hold for an hour? Oh, it would have been like, I think I actually did an hour climb, and I think it was like 362, something like that. Light guy as well? Yeah. Okay. All right, what is... You cut that one. <laughs> no, we're not cutting that, that's staying in. Would you prefer to do long, steady rides or short, intense intervals? Long, steady, any day of the week. What's one good piece of training advice you would get, give to people getting into cycling? Fuel it right. Okay. What would be your go-to pre-ride coffee? Ah, uh, just an espresso. Favourite post-ride meal? Oh, probably, I used to love the old Nutribullet with everything in it. <laughs> everything. Oats, bananas, yoghurt. Fair. Uh, would you have beer, wine or something else? Beer. Who is going to win the tour this year? Oh, I think it's hard to go past the Visma guys, isn't it? Yeah. But, Good uh, work. I, I don't know. Go I'd on. love to see. I'd love to see Pogacar win. Okay. What's your proudest achievement? Oh, two kids. <laughs> yeah, I like that. Actually, that's really cool. <laughs> What's your favourite race? 
favourite, what's my favourite race? Probably have to say being from Australia, Tour Down Under. Okay, who is your hero? Who is my hero? Oh, I'd say Lance, but I'm not sure you're really allowed to say that either. You're free to uh, say what you like. It's a safe space. My hero. Oh, actually, I do know that. My hero is Mark Marquez. Okay, yeah. I like that. Yeah. Um, what is your worst race you've ever done? Worst race I've ever done? Oh, Vuelta. <laughs> what was bad about it? Well, to, I guess, probably that I didn't have any motivation to, to do it. I guess being from Australia, you always start at Tour Down Under and you're on fumes by that. Yeah. Beautiful race, no disrespect, but I, yeah, it's a, I never enjoyed myself there. <laughs> okay, right, last question. Who is your favourite and who has been your least favourite teammate you've ever had? Oh, favourite. It's, it's a hard one to say. I'd probably have to say Mads Peterson. Yeah. Just because, I don't know, he's just a... A legend that's uh, least favourite, hard to say really. Probably one of the guys that tests positive on, on one of the teams oh, I've been yeah. with has, has to yeah, be. Yeah, that's going to be out of there. That's a fair comment <laughs> yeah. to make. But right. it is, isn't it? Yeah, all right, there you go. 20 questions. I think it was slightly yeah. less. Yeah. Richie Port, top yeah. job. Go on, no, fist bump. The fist bump. Caught you it's out. Dope as suck, <laughs> <don't they? laughs> Some great answers there from Richie. Very candid. He seemed quite relaxed after his ride with Alex there, didn't he? Um, and also, it seemed like he'd read that study before, um, given that his one piece of training advice is to fuel correctly. So there we go. Uh, right, cycling shorts now, and we will start with the news that Eddie Merck's bikes are back. Now, if I'm honest, I wasn't completely aware wasn't. that they had gone anywhere, but they've certainly been quiet for a couple of years, but now they've just launched a new 80s retro colorway to celebrate the Panasonic team of that era, and they look quite good. I like the look of them. Yeah. Uh, some good news now. Uh, you may remember a few weeks ago that we talked on the show about a bunch of bikes that were being held hostage by a courier after the World Triathlon Championships, which took place in Spain. Uh, that was because of a dispute between them and the travel company. Well. The hostages, so to speak, have now been released, all 186 bikes. Which sounds great, doesn't it? Except it's not all good news because the bikes might be free, but they need to be collected from a warehouse in Los Angeles, no matter where in the US the owners live. That could be quite a way. Oh my goodness me. Yeah, you'd be pretty peed off, wouldn't you, if you'd paid for that service? Yeah, I really would. Like genuinely, I would be furious. <laughs> um, I mean, thankfully, it's coincided with the winter, but then I suppose it's, it's quite a few parts of the States where it's, it's not very wintry. So you, no. might have, you might have appreciated having a uh, badass time trial bike to skim around. Not on. very wintry where the bikes are based, presumably, in LA. Decent weather over the winter, isn't it? No, good point, yeah. Uh, we'll stick with LA for a moment, or close to it at least, because police in Huntington Beach have done what I think we'd like police to be able to do everywhere, using bait bikes to catch bike thieves. Yes. So on their Facebook page, Huntington Beach Police describe how someone who stole one of their bait bikes was then pursued by officers on the ground and in the air, adding a note at the end of their post, attention to all potential bike bandits, think twice before making a move in our city, that tempting bike might be bait and we're ready to catch you red-handed. <laughs> As always though, uh, the other aspect of stolen bikes is people buying them. Yes. Uh, if you think something is dodgy, it is probably best not to purchase it. Yes, definitely. Feels like nowhere is calmer more evident than in buying a stolen bike. No. It'll come around to bite you one day, won't it? Uh, right, I read a great article on Velo News last week about a guy called Colin Gay, who's a 48-year-old father of two from Virginia in the US. Now, I think our 30 and 30 challenge for January is a good one, but he has ridden for 3,360 days consecutively. And not just like a little ride either, but 30 miles minimum. Yeah, it's like 48 kilometers minimum, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. His aim though, is to do 10,000 days in a row, which equates to 27 years we worked out, didn't we? 27. Yeah, I mean, he is already over eight years in, so that is one thing. I mean, he's only got 19 mm. years to go. But, I mean, it's incredible, really, isn't it? Um, anyway, check out his Instagram and hats off to Colin as well. I've just I'm, worked out. I'm amazed. If I start that now, I'll be finished when I'm 70. It's <laughs> a scary thought, isn't it? <laughs> oh, my word, yeah. <laughs> anyway, we say hats off to Colin. He's probably not going to see this, is he? No, I doubt it. He'll probably be on his bike, isn't he? He probably will, yeah. Um, now, we mentioned, briefly, our 13 30 challenge there. You've not got many days left to round out the challenge in January. If you skipped a few, 
Don't worry about it, it doesn't matter. Just join us for the last little push. Finish the month with a bang. You can join us on Zwift, if you like, every day, uh, twice a day, in mm. fact. I'm doing my first one, actually, this coming Saturday evening, UK time, 6.30 p.m. So see, uh, if you join me, if you can get above a level of uh, two out of 10 effort. You're doing 6.30 on Sunday, aren't you? I'm doing 6.30 on Sunday, but to be honest with you, I quite want to go for a ride with you on Saturday as well. I mean, that is newsworthy. We should have started the whole GCN <laughs> show this way. You can well, go don't forget it's a non-drop ride. So you could go at a 2 out of 10 effort level. You could, yeah. And not drop me. Well, that is true. That, yeah. Anyway, join Dan for this momentous occasion, 6.30 UK time on Zwift. Um, you just got to join the GCN club on Zwift, which is, of course, free to do once you're a Zwift subscriber. Um, and you don't need to be on Zwift either. Just get involved. Any 30 minutes of exercise will do. It's a broad church, the 30 and 30, isn't it? So you're welcome along if you're running. There was a bit of debate about whether walking the dog counts. I hope so. That's what I've been doing. Well, if it's a brisk walk days. with the dog, I oh, think I've it's got, okay. I, I've got really into how many minutes per kilometre I'm walking. <laughs> Sub nine is really sort of quite good. Nine minute Ks? Yeah. Well, that, is, that does sound quite mm. brisk. Yeah, it is brisk. I bet you half wheel whoever you're walking well, with. Well, no, I, I, yeah, I rarely go that speed if I'm with anybody. <laughs> <laughs> Except uh, the dog. Okay, right. Well, um, let's finish Cycling Short Show now. Um, some news from here in the UK, some sad news. Mick Ives, an absolute legend of the sport on these shores, sadly passed away last week at the age of 84. It's hard to sum up his impact on cycling, both as a racer, winning a total of 81 national titles, spanning road, track, time trial, mountain bike and cyclocross. In fact, he's the only male British rider who's represented Great Britain in all cycling disciplines. That is pretty incredible, mm. isn't it? He also managed professional teams on the road and off-road, plus had a long-running race team that developed a whole load of talented young riders as well. So his impact here and abroad as well was big, wasn't it? It but was, yeah. Most of all, I think, just a continued passion for cycling. 81 mm. national titles. Yeah. We... I mean, I remember him distinctly from my mountain bike days, as I'm sure you did. Yeah. If you were a young track rider of our sort of generation, or road, or time trial, anything else, you probably knew Mick Ives, didn't you? Yeah, absolutely. Bit of a wake up call, that 81 national titles. Yeah, I better get started. You better, yeah. Yet. How many have you got? One. One. <laughs> 80 to go. So 80 to go, yeah. for me. Yeah. Mm. That's, yeah, that's quite a lot, isn't it? Hack forward slash bodge of the week now. A reminder that you can now go to upload.globalcyclingnetwork.com to submit your hacks and bodges or any that you've seen. But our first one this week comes in from Alex, who said, first I thought this might have been attempted at a mudguard, but then I realized it was joined onto the rear light. So does the milk bottle carton glow red? Yeah, so what are we looking at here, Dan? It, it literally is a small milk bottle carton stuffed over the top of a light, hmm. a rear light, which... I bet that would glow up quite brightly. Yeah. At night. I mean, I suppose it would. Do we think it's more visible? Certainly from the side, I guess it'd be more visible. Yeah, there is that. And a lot of bike accidents happen from the side, so we're told. Um, well, I mean, can we reserve judgment on a hack or a bodge? Because you need to really see it at night to see how effective it is, don't you? You do, really. I'm a bit flummoxed by this one. I don't know what to do. Well, uh, since this is a picture of a bike randomly spotted, I don't think we're going to get a submission of one of this bike at night to see if it does indeed work. We should ask our own Alex to, to make recreate. this for us. Yeah, I mean, it might be that the light had broken. Maybe there's like the, the glass you know, is cracked. And this is actually oh, this is protection. Protection, from the yeah. So uh, yeah, I think I think maybe we will recreate this. Okay. Uh, and then and judge uh, afterwards. And then judge afterwards. Okay. Yeah. Well, let but, us know what uh, you think at home. Yeah. Do you think that would work at night or not? Yeah. Well, we've got another lighty one here from Paul. Um, he said, "Whenever I used to ride after dark, I couldn't see what gear I was in. To avoid cross chaining and see what gear I was in, I mounted a pen flashlight." with rubber bands <laughs> to the right rear chainstay. The pictures show the result. Waterproof, rechargeable pen flashlight lights are available on the internet. I think even at night, I could look down at my front chain rings and see whether I was under big or yeah. the small guy. I mean, I, to be fair, and most- And judge with speed how far up or down the cassette I was. Yeah, like I ride at night a lot, like, well, normally home from work. And I guess most of the time I'm riding on a slightly lit road, mm. so I don't have this feeling. Yeah. But I do feel like it's not something I've ever thought I needed. 
you know what I mean? I think I'm also very aware of what gear I'm in at any point. Particularly as you've only normally got two, or even now one at the front, but if you've only got two chain rings at the front, I know if I'm in the big ring or the small ring, based on what I've recently shifted to, and based on speed, I'll know whether I'm cross-chaining or not. I also actively like cross-chaining. Do you? I do! There's just something about leaving it in the big ring, mm. it just makes you feel like, you know, like a... Well, is the inefficiency of cross-chaining offset by the extra efficiency of the chain being on the two biggest cogs? Well. It's irrelevant. The, the inefficiency of it is offset by the morale boost for knowing <laughs> that you're still in the big ring, mm. personally. So uh, well, call this me is a simple I, man. This but... is why I like 52 big rings. Exactly, yeah. I've got a 52 on mm. uh, on my bike at the moment. On and the it, back? It's, no, on the front. And it's throwing me into all sorts of like disarray. What do you normally have? I normally have a 50 to okay. make myself feel good. <laughs> and now I'm like, crikey, I'm going to have to shift into a little ring. I'm like, don't worry. Just because I got a 52 on there. Mm. But anyway, so yeah, uh, I'm going to say that's a bodge. I'm going to say it's a bodge as well, I just don't think it's needed. No. If you disagree, let us know in the comments. I mean, it could have been a hack if the rubber bands were not um, nude elastic, nude mm. rubber colour. I think if they is were that black, the only maybe. thing, is it? Well, it's just. If it was zip tie with blue zip ties, so I'd be all well, over if, it. If there was zip ties, it'd be an absolute bodge. <laughs> um, probably the frame would have fractured underneath them. But there are lots of light related hacks and bodges this week. It's like a theme. Uh, this next one is from Peter. Uh, nobody wants to ruin the look of their road bike with a mudguard, but during the mucky winter weather, if you run a seat post mounted camera, you stand to lose any useful footage after going through a puddle or two. Ah. Cue the camera mudguard. It's sleek enough not to be noticeably poor ergonomically, but big enough to prevent, prevent the mud uh, getting onto the lens. I'm using a two cycling, well, and the guard is made from TPU, giving it a big bit of flexibility uh, to push onto the camera and remain firmly in place. Well, uh, so for those listening on the podcast, this is effectively, it's like a, a small ass saver below a <laughs> rear viewing camera, which yeah. protects the lens. Well, I mean, I've got to say, that does sound like quite a good idea, really. Yeah. It is a, I never really thought about that before, but yeah, if you are relying on your rear camera to provide evidence, potentially, if you get smushed, then uh, you probably want the evidence to be visible. Yeah. It'd be really annoying if there was a big mud splot over the number plate, wouldn't it? It would be, yeah. Really annoying, especially lugging it around all the time. That's a reason why I'm not a huge fan of rear-facing cameras, but anyway, a little mud guard might sort it out. At this point in my cycling fitness side, there's no point in having a rear-facing camera. There's nobody ever behind me. <laughs> yeah, but cars come up to you pretty quick Very when you're going quick. at your yeah, speed. I mean, they're blurred anyway. <laughs> yeah, good point. Um, oh, I don't know I'm what to say about no, this I'm going happy with that. I think oh, if yeah? you do want to get footage from behind you whilst you're riding, like they said, what you don't want is it all being spluttered. I mean, this goes back to my story of being in the Giro d'Italia and being the first pro rider to have a camera on my bike in a race at that level. Yeah. Have I never told you this? No, we're 11 years in. Like, this is a story <laughs> I've, I've not heard before. I've told this story at some point. Maybe. So it was mounted, but in the neutral zone, there was like a sort of an Italian-styled cobbled section, and that was enough to make it blurred. It, it lost focus, so I did a 200 kilometer stage with a very weighty, it was not, nothing like these new lightweight GoPros. This had a proper battery strapped to the frame. So it was quite weighty and the footage was completely useless. Are you serious? The cobbles ruined the camera? Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. God, I wonder what other stories there are still to come out <laughs> not after many, 11 not years. Many. Certainly not many that are at all entertaining. No, all right, I'm gonna say, uh, I'm gonna say hack for that one as well, because okay. um, it does look quite neat, doesn't it? And yeah. uh, it seems to solve a problem. Uh, right, we're gonna finish up with the Artful Bodger. Um, so, yeah, here we go. Uh, remember when Everesting was a thing? It does feel like it's gone slightly out of fashion now, Everesting, doesn't it? Um, I fitted a hideously big sprocket to get up the steepest hill on the Mendips. Now, I mean, really everyone on the planet should know what the Mendips are, but just in case you don't, there are a range of incredibly high mountains local to us here in, uh, mm. in this part of the UK. Uh, they go up to a staggering 300 metres of elevation. Um, anyway, uh, Andy said uh, it doesn't need any more, so he's turned it into a clock. So there it is, quite a oh, yeah. natty looking blue clock. I quite like that. Yeah, I think it looks better as a clock than it did as a sprocket. Absolutely. Um, but fair play to you, Andy, for Everesting. Oh my goodness, Draycott Steep. So uh, Draycott is... Um, 
uh, a bit of a regular feature on GCN videos. If we need a mm. ridiculously steep climb, that's what we use. So yeah, fair play to you, Andy. You Andy, Andy Rich, Everested Draycott Steep. In 12 hours and 46 minutes. How's oh, that going? Sir. Yeah, 90 miles uh, to Everest. Well, I think there's a hack from me and Cy for that one as well. So yeah, a couple of bodges, yeah. couple of hacks. Uh, thanks again for your submissions, and we'll be back with those at the same time next week. Yeah, if you couldn't remember, by the way, uh, upload a, what is it? Upload Upload.globalcyclingnetwork.com. Upload there you go. If, like me, you can't remember the address, uh, it's in the description beneath this video on YouTube. So there you go. It's time now for Caption Competition, that part of the show where you get a chance to get your hands on a coveted GCN Camelback water bottle. I mean, it doesn't say GCN on it just yet. No, it's just... It's we are still waiting for an update just on the that. GCN HQ, isn't it? Basically, yeah. We, uh, we remember, well, once a week to ask, and it's just before we film the GCN show. <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah. There'll be no updates. Yeah, yeah be but anyway, soon. it's a banger of a bottle, so uh, so make sure you get involved in the caption competition. Uh, right, this was the photo we gave you last week, which was Ellie Viviani and um, Filippo Ganna with their new cask Eero helmets. Eero helmets, yes. And our winner this week is S. Gillespie UK, who put caption competition, New helmet ear covers have been proven to increase the number of watts. Yeah. I think that's very clever. For those, well, yeah, I would probably need to say the spelling, don't we? Watts spelled W H A T S. So, yeah. What? <laughs> what? Yeah, see, got it. That's cool. Um, yeah, I like that very much. Well done, S Gillespie UK. A hey, uh, GCN Camelback water bottle is winging its way to you as soon as you get in touch with us and tell you your tell tell you tell us your address. Uh, right, Dan. How on form are you this week? Well, you're about to find out. This week's photo is this one. Another it's, Ineos one? Yeah, it's Jonathan Navarez, second overall at Tour Down Under, uh, sitting in a team van before the start of one of the stages, complete with an ice vest over his shoulders. Uh, I will get you started, as ever. Hey guys, check out my six steam pack. I see what you did there, mate. Yeah, the ice, uh, the ice pack, the ice vest has got 16 pockets of ice in it. There you go. Mm. I like that, Dan. Well done. I mean, I think you might be able to do better, viewers. Uh, so uh, get involved in the comment section down below. Put your witty caption in there, and we will, as always, pick a winner next week. I, I tell you what, I'd love to read the captions given by podcast listeners who have to go literally by the description of the photo that we've given. Ah, yeah. Well, how are, we gonna, how are you, how are you going to submit them, podcast listeners? Maybe on... Well, so, I mean, since we, we, we're new to podcasting, I don't know if there's any kind of comment. You can leave comments, can't you? Maybe you know, can you? Maybe you have to leave the captions in the reviews. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because I might be, uh, you know, I listen to podcasts when I'm doing the washing up mm. or driving. And, and so rarely comment on them. Uh, well, I've never commented I've never, on no, never podcast, commented. No. I think I've rarely commented on, on a YouTube apart from replying to comments on ours. Well, perhaps if someone listens to this as a podcast, fancies clicking on the YouTube video and leaving us a comment <laughs> and explaining how you're going to comment, then uh, we'd really appreciate that. Um, just to, you know, get us into the 21st century. Mm. Uh, yeah, that would be good, wouldn't it? It's now just a few moments until we reveal what's coming up on GCN this week. Uh, but first up, underneath last week's show, we had a few uh, brilliant comments. First up, from Fabian Guillard. Fabian here from the Hack Bodge of the Week section. I agreed with Dan, my bar tape doesn't look great. That's because I didn't think about taking a photo of the broken shifter before I reattached it. Ah. I took the photo at the end of the day so the tight string had time to imprint itself on the cork style bar tape. The piece of string is so long because that's my clothes hanging line and I wasn't willing to cut it. There you go. That's a great bit of context for last week. We called it a hack, I think, anyway, didn't we? we Fixing did. a broken shifter by literally attach, reattaching it to the handlebar with string. Uh, so yeah, well done Fabian, and thanks for letting us know. Um, Pep8691 said, there is zero chance that Simon Manon got through the performance enhancing crotch layering scene in one take. Um, now that is true, we didn't get through it in one take, uh, but it's not for the reason that you think. Pro level clit, clit? <coughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> It actually took five minutes. That that clip is five minutes long of me giggling Crying. away to myself. I know. I think everyone starts to get a little bit bored, but um, such is my <laughs> tiny little mind. Um, yes. Uh, then we had one from Austin Hughes one three four saying, "Great looking kit. 
The opposite can be said about the price of the kit, and this was a bit of a theme uh, amongst the many comments on our new Ahu kit. Uh, loads of you liked it, some were a bit unsure, but there were lots of people talking about the price point. And yes, it is very much at the high end of price points for Lycra on bikes. And we're well aware of that, but this is the very, very top end kit that you will see ridden by Jonas Vinegar, who've won the Tour de France for the last two years. And of course, Visma Lisa bike, as they're called now, are not going to settle for anything less than the best. Yeah, so that kit is super premium. Now, we're not suggesting that everyone needs to go out and buy that kit. Fundamentally, it's what, what we get to wear and want to wear, isn't it, when we're making videos. So it's what you lot watch as much as anything. So I think it's cool that, you know, it's about as nice as it gets, really. But the other really important thing to remember is that in the GCN shop, we not only sell the premium kit that can win Tours de France or, you know, get Jonas and Sepp up to a two out of 10 effort level. Um, we've also got our GCN fan kits, which, are way, way more affordable. So hopefully there is something for everyone on there, even if you don't necessarily or can't necessarily take the plunge no. on the super premium stuff. No, I think so. We are very well aware that there are a lot of people out there who can't afford to buy premium kits or some of the premium bikes that we get to use on the channel either. Nor could you justify it even if you could afford it, I think, to a certain no, extent. No, I do question that myself. I mean, obviously we are very lucky in that we get the kits and a lot of the bikes for free. Uh, we get to use them before we give the bikes back. Whether or not I could justify paying that much for a bike, I very much doubt it if I wasn't uh, able to do that. But there are people out there that do have the expendable money and the will and the wish to buy top-end bikes and kit, but we completely understand that there's other people that don't and will never, even if they had a lot of money, do that. But it's out there if you would like to buy it. It is fantastic kit. We love the feel of it. We haven't really got to use it too much in terms of the short-sleeved aero kit. Alex uh, has. Well, do you I know he finished 80 what, uh, 81, 18th in the Rattle Gravel no, I didn't. Gravel race. Yeah, yeah, a fully legit, like, pro gravel race. And Alex finished 18th at the end of what was effectively a stage race at the Tour Down Under because he worked absolutely flat out every day. Mm. That's quite impressive, isn't it? Yeah. Well, it was like, only because of his kit, of course. Well, yeah, my kit obviously didn't help me in, in a Zwift race. No, no that's a so Plus, they had the same kit. Well, this is it. It was mm. like, yeah, it was no like a scientific experiment, game. wasn't it? Yeah, you were on the same stuff. Right, speaking of science, moving on. Um, do heavier riders really descend faster? It was a video where Connor and I stretched our tiny minds trying to get our heads around no, the physics. No, you didn't. I've just read the comment. Uh, what's that? The first comment. From Brent F, most impressive thing about this video is that Simon did a curl with a 25 kilo vest. Yeah. Albeit with two arms and only one rep. It but is still true. 12 and a half kilos an arm, that's not bad. It's not bad, is it? Yeah. yeah. Um, also, Connor stitched me up and made me ride up that flipping climb three times with that vest on. Um, and then uh, C Weaver said, as a 110 kilo cyclist, I can confirm I'm rather quick when gravity is on my side. I'm also rather slow when gravity is fighting against mm -hmm. me. So uh, yeah, um, I feel you're paying on that one. We raced the best riders on the planet. Here's what happens. This was Dan's video where he took on mm. the might of the combined forces of Jonas Vinegar and Sepp Kuss. That's enough to make anyone quake in their boots. Yeah. Particularly you, mate. Um, I'm going to take the liberty of reading loads of them out Go because on. I thought it was great. Bobby Ellis, props to Dan for getting Jonas to relax a bit. Uh, both he and Sepp seem like legitimately nice guys. Was that your impression too? It was. It was my impression. I mean, if I had the form of Jonas Vinegar, I'd be quite relaxed as well, <laughs> bracing me. Yeah, uh, Matt is Max said, I'm surprised Dan prefers such a low cadence. So what's going on, Dan? Maybe if you'd changed gear, you'd have won. Well, I know it was, I couldn't figure it out at the time either. It just kept, it seemed to keep dropping. I think just a lack of fitness. I mean, a lower cadence is more efficient if you don't have that much power, isn't it? Yeah. The higher the power, the higher the most efficient cadence. It's why these huge track sprinters spin at such a high cadence. But um, yeah, something maybe for me to work on. Yeah, I think so. That's always good to have a have a goal in mind. Uh, um, uh, Killian Kelly chimed in. Uh, Sorry, what? You don't build lactate until after six seconds? This is uh, in reference to Jonas's comment. He said, I'm the owner of two legs that would beg to differ. <laughs> yeah, I quite... I'm, I was quite intrigued by that. I was just like, oh, Jonas said it, so it must be true. No, I said it. Oh, is that, it was your comment, was it? Yeah, and he oh. agreed. Oh. He agreed with me. Oh, this is something I read, I mean, this is something I read a long time ago. It might have been debunked itself by this point, but apparently, you know, in the initial sprint for a time trial, for example, that you use to get up to speed, you don't pay for that as long as it doesn't go on beyond about five or six seconds. To be fair, I think I agree with that. I think I might have heard something similar back in the day. Um, <laughs> Arbon said, love this. Dan, you are still a stud at 43. 
Yeah, that was uh, one of the themes of the comments, really. Yeah, wasn't it was it? amazing how many <laughs> comments we had about you being a stud. I mean, we get that all the time, anyway. Um, and then, uh, lastly, Fast Freddy nine three four one said, "This was fun to watch. Three great athletes." So I'm not entirely sure which video you were watching, um, but certainly there were two, mm. weren't there that day? I mean, those of you that watched it will know that Jonas was cheating because he had his race weight plugged into his weight. He whip, did. He, he let... a couple of kilos heavier at this point in the year. Well, he let it slip, didn't he? What his race weight was. He did. What was it? Fifty-eight kilos. Fifty-eight kilos. I would not yeah, have thought it was that light. Should be basic. He should have to wear that twenty-five kilo vest in all pro races, shouldn't it? It should be illegal to be sub sixty kilos on the climb. Well, especially because he's got he's got muscly legs, mm. doesn't he? Like he's like a muscly dude. He's not yeah. like a you know pipe cleaner he's like you are. Futuristic hollow muscles he must have. <laughs> Imagine that. Whereas I'm quite dense. <laughs> yeah, you are. <laughs> I mean, my ankles are hollow, which is just as well. Otherwise, mm. I wouldn't be able to move. Uh, right, that's probably enough of wittering on about that. Yes, video. it is. Uh, coming up on the channel then this week, we will start with Wednesday, uh, which is how does the menstrual cycle affect your riding? Yeah, it's a good one from Man on that one, so do check that one out. Uh, Thursday is What's in Your Pocket? Pro Training Edition, I've got written down here. Uh, yeah, so we basically uh, we stationed ourselves on the busiest climb in Girona and jumped out of the bushes, oh, right. unsuspecting passing <laughs> cyclists, and asked what was in their pockets. So. Uh, I, uh, I was there to witness Alex Bonya, the winner of oh, Swift yeah. Academy from a couple of years. Stop it. Yeah, good. Happy as ever. Uh, telling us that he was about to do the mammal loop. Uh, so, uh, yeah, anyway, there we go. He, he was, he was for that, surely. Well, it was, it was his dad, apparently, had come over to right. stay and, and just kept doing the mammal loop. <laughs> Which is, you'd like it. 60k, did it in three hours. Yeah, sounds about right. Yeah, I thought so. Um, right, Friday, you know, we were saying about Alex uh, repping the GCN kit properly, mm. uh, well, he took his ultimate crit bike that he's been building over on the tech channel to Adelaide and took part in a couple of super fast, legit crits. Uh, so check out those to see how he got on. And, um, well, I think he did all right, I think, didn't he? Well, it's all relative. I'd say he did very well. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, then Saturday, um, we uh, have got our new nutrition partner, Pre Precision. Precision. Sorry. Nutrition. Yes, thank you for that, Dan. Precision Hydration and Nutrition, and uh, they do sweat testing. So we might finally get to the bottom of why Connor and Alex both nearly died of dehydration this year. <laughs> Uh, and then finally, Dan, what have we got? Uh, Cromwell and Bottas, the Adelaide Rise. Alex was very busy, wasn't he? Whilst, he was, yeah. he was out in Adelaide, and he had the privilege uh, of catching up with Tiffany Cromwell and Valtteri Bottas uh, for a ride. He was going to try and go go-karting, wasn't he, with, with Bottas? But I think Bottas was a little bit afraid of losing to Alex. Well, it? that's it, yeah. Not much to gain for Bottas racing Alex in a go-kart. But yeah, I cannot wait to watch that one. I've not seen it yet. No. But, uh, but that's super cool. He said they were both total legends. So, uh, so yeah, that should be, uh, should be a mega watch. Make sure you check it out on Sunday. Mm. Right, right then. That is all for this week's GCN Show. Thanks for watching. Or listening. Ooh, yeah, absolutely. And uh, well done for getting to the end, I guess. Yeah, there's no prize this week. Sorry. <sighs>